Well, Jesus came and made the world a better place. And when you and I become more like Jesus, we make the world a better place. I just have to tell you, I woke up this morning having an unusual experience. I was in what seemed to be full conversation with God when I woke up. And that, that's not normal for me uh, to have that type of encounter. Some people are all dreams and visions, you know, in their whole focus. That's not really the way I function, not really the way the Lord uh, partners with me. But this morning, it was really profound when I woke up. And I just, I, I just sense that today God wants to do something remarkable, something unique. Every, every week we gather together, we encounter the Savior. And that in and of itself is marvelous. Wouldn't you agree? But I believe God wants to do something really um, timely. Sometimes there, there, there are seasons and times that God purposes that are uniquely a part of His plan. And it's almost like there's a sense, if you'll just really engage with me on this, I believe there's a sense of an open window that God wants to give us something of a special treasure from His heart today. And uh, if you're a first-time guest, God purposed that you would land here on this Sunday. And um, if you've been going here for years, then here we are today in what I believe to be a significant moment in time. I, I don't think my message is, you know, like this blow-away message, um, but I know God's having a conversation. That's what this is about. This is not, hey, I've got my best message for you today. That's, that's what I'm trying to say. This is about God, I believe, pulling back the curtain maybe a little more than what He normally does to show us something of His nature in a very powerful and profound way. Will you just engage your faith that we'll experience that from Him today as we press in and go just a little deeper? Lord, we thank You for the power of Your Spirit. We thank You for the treasure of Your Word. Lord, we bask in Your phenomenal, transforming presence. Thank You, Lord, for a wonderful time of worship, a sense of great celebration from the heart of our Father, who happens to be the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords, the undefeated warrior who has never been defeated. We just receive you are fighting our battles on our behalf. What a tremendous privilege it is. I pray you awaken something supernatural and significant within us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are understanding in this particular season of our church family, 2018, can you believe it's October, we're in the final quarter of the year. Uh, I want to just challenge you, when God reveals something, He does not reveal it just to tell us what's to come. He reveals it so that we use it as a weapon to bring His will to pass. This is a year of flourishing. You're created to flourish. Everyone say, I am created to flourish. I, uh, I want you to know you're created to flourish. I'm kind of scanning uh, the room, and I'm thinking about some of the challenges that have come uh, this year. It's good to see the rockers here uh, and love you guys. I know it's been a very challenging year, but I just declare this final quarter, this is the thing Tracy said to me coming into this year. She felt like the Lord was saying it was a year of flourishing, but in the final quarter of the year was when we were going to really begin to see the fruitfulness of God. I'm declaring that over the rockers. I'm declaring that over the Perrys who have been walking through this. I'm declaring that over every circumstance and situation. Maybe you felt like this year hasn't looked like a year of flourishing. Can I encourage you? Don't look at it and say, well, I guess we missed it. You need to look at that and say, this word is my weapon. It will come to pass in Jesus' mighty name. That's the way we use the word of God in our hand. It's a sword. Mary Guyton is sitting right here on the second row. And uh, why don't you just raise both your hands up, Mary? Everybody can see who you are. Come on, this woman. I'm just going to tell you right now, I went to see her in the hospital months ago, and we all wondered if she was going to survive. She, had, she was not responsive at all, didn't even know that I was there when I was there. God brought her from death to life, and here she is today celebrating. Come on. It's a year of flourishing. When your family is looking at you, laying on what seems to be your deathbed, and, and you heard it was a year of flourishing, then you got a choice to make. You can submit to the circumstance and say, well, my mountain's bigger than my God, 
or you can submit to God and say, my God can move this mountain. And I'm declaring we've come into a season where God wants to move some mountains. Hopeless situations suddenly begin to be filled with hope. Powerless situations suddenly begin to be filled with power. I feel the Lord saying this morning even the issues and, and circumstances of temptation where we have found ourselves seemingly incapable of conquering temptation that has come to our lives. God is filling us with the revelation ability from God Almighty to be able to more than conquer those situations. Will you receive that over our church family, over the body of Christ? Come on, awaken it in our community today, in our city. Let Oklahoma City flourish as a result of the church that has come alive in Christ in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. There's a powerful uh, revelation for us to reflect on last week as we talked about comparison. And if you're in a constant state of want or a constant state of lust for more, you're comparing yourself with people who have more, and that produces a complaint. That comparison produces a complaint. But when you compare yourself with those who have less, that comparison produces compassion. So we must learn to give consideration to those that are less fortunate than us to produce and drive us into a perspective of awakened compassion from God. That in and of itself will cause us to leave the world a better place rather than just trying to decorate our own lives. And in this idea, God wants to instill and awaken something within us today. I want you to imagine how horrible it would be if we lived in a world with no watermelons. Not a watermelon one. I mean, that would be horrible. But suddenly, somebody found, in a world of no watermelons, they found one watermelon. <clears throat> Do you know the power of one watermelon? In a world with no watermelons, all of a sudden we find one watermelon. And I have actually studied this this last week, wanting to use this illustration. And I have found that a watermelon can have as many as 800 seeds. That is crazy to me. I mean, I, I, I have eaten watermelons before that had a whole bunch of seeds, and I thought, this is ridiculous. How many of you love seedless watermelons? Can I just tell you, seedless watermelons might taste good, but they are worthless. They have no seed. If we could, in a world full of, a world with no watermelons, if we could find one watermelon and it could have 800 seeds, then do you do understand we could have 800 watermelons immediately? After producing 800 watermelons from just one watermelon, we could then have 640,000 watermelons, and then a third planting, we could then have 512 million watermelons. How many of you know we could replenish the earth with watermelons with just one watermelon if we would simply understand the principle of the seed? What do you think I want to talk to you about today? I want to talk to you about the vicious cycle of blessing that God wants to initiate in your life. I want you to allow me to move past the mindset in you of the church being all about the dollar and all about the finance. And I want you to allow me to talk to you about something beyond just your finance, but including your finance. God wants to initiate the vicious cycle of blessing to awaken the blessing of God in the earth. And we need to not diffuse and dismiss the things that maybe have been abused in times past. I'm stepping in with boldness and confidence today to awaken something that God wants every one of us to possess, that the world becomes a better place because we've walked this out with him. I want you to think about how Abraham cried out to God, God, I want a son. I want a son. Oh, God, just give me a son. Can you imagine how happy would have, he would have been if God would have just simply said, Abraham, you got it. I'm going to give you a son. But if you go back and you look at the conversation Abraham was having with God, that's not what God said. God said, kings are going to come from your loins. Abraham is begging for a son. God not only responds to his request for a son, but he starts in, enlarging that to something beyond what he could imagine in that moment of time, saying, kings are going to come from you. Ultimately, Abraham's cry for a son was God's cry for a son because there was no son of God in the earth as 
Adam sinned, it left the world without a son of God to awaken the plans of God. So God then began to initiate the legacy through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the 12 tribes of Israel until through Judah came David, came Solomon, came Jesus, who stepped out on the scene 42 generations after Abraham was begging for a son. And he said, what? I am the seed of Abraham. Do you understand all the world needs is one seed through Jesus planted in the earth, awakened to become the resurrection power of God. Now, sons and daughters of God, give him praise. That's who we are. Come on, his seed is awakened within us. Give him praise today. We recognize the call of God. It's a vicious cycle of blessing. It's a vicious cycle of blessing. It's the seed multiplied, producing an uncontrollable harvest. And believe me, the enemy wants to control this harvest. He wants to stifle this harvest. He wants to contain this harvest. He wants you and I to be so focused on ourselves, on a self-absorbed existence, that we cannot be contributors to the expansion of the blessing of Abraham. Not only is Jesus the seed of Abraham, but you and I are now sons and daughters of Abraham because that seed produced a great harvest. And now here we are, many sons of God in the world. Aren't you glad God decided to awaken sons and daughters in the earth. We're not just a bunch of people trying to be moral. We're not just a bunch of people trying to find our way to be good. We're not searching for the best. This is, I'm going to live my best life. I want to try and find my best existence. No, we, we need to understand it's more than that. It's actually answering, Paul said it this way, I take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. There was a day God looked at Robert Walls and said, I'm not going to let him out of my sight. I'm going to take a hold of him. And he began to, began to sense something in his heart. Evan began to sense something in his heart. Linda began to sense something in her heart. Trey began to sense something in his heart. You understand, God God began to take hold of you because he had something in mind that he wanted to awaken within you that would bring transformation not only to your life, but to your world. Your world awaits for you understanding the, the revelation of Christ that's being awakened within you today. What is that about, and have you taken hold of that? This is where we understand the principle of the seed, and this is where the vicious cycle of blessing begins to be awakened, and this is why we're focusing in this particular season on what it is to be financially activated. There's something God wants to do as we are, as our lives become financially activated. It's interesting, Proverbs 11:25 says, a generous person will prosper, and whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. A generous person will prosper. Now, again, we've lost our focus because we've had such emphasis brought in the wrong direction. I wanna just point out to you, this is not about being prosperous, This is about being generous. A generous person will prosper, and whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. See, we want God to change our lives. I want God to change my life. It's normal for us to want God to change our lives, but I'm just going to tell you something. This is a really important truth. God doesn't change your life. God changes you, and you change your life. That's how God changes the situations around you. He doesn't just change your circumstances or you'll just keep thinking them back down to where they were. That's just the way we are. It's just normal. I've found that when God wants to take me into a new level of life, he normally introduces me to a new friendship that helps me think on a different level so that I then can occupy and, and, and maintain what God has helped me obtain. How many of you know it is easier to obtain than it is to maintain? Have you figured this out yet? If you've not figured this out, you've never been married. It is easier to obtain than it is to maintain. And God's not just trying to get you to obtain and change your life and put everything in your possession. God's trying to position you to be able to maintain what he wants you to obtain so that you don't just think yourself back down and the blessing just splashes out of your life. God wants to change you. This is about being generous. That was a blank, by the way. I hope you caught that on your, on your handout. God wants to change us, and that's what changes our lives. See, your, your life is significantly attached to you. Your life is significantly attached to you. I, I want to just challenge everybody in the room, myself included. Let's evaluate this, how we can gain something from the edge of this particular truth. 
But the lie, and, and we've all bought into this in one way or another many times over the course of our lives, the lie that says, well, when I have more, then I'll give. When I have more, then I, oh, I, I know I'm going to learn to be generous, but I just don't have it right now. And when I have more, then I'll learn generosity. I want to just remind you, God doesn't change your life. God changes you, and that's what changes your life. This didn't say the prosperous person will be generous. This said the generous person will prosper. A generous person gives, and it begins to unlock this vicious cycle of prosperity in our lives. God never works with what we don't have. God always works with what we do have. Therefore, we have to take what we do have, put it in His hands, and it unlocks then more of what He has in store for us to carry to our world. How many of you are ready for God to unlock more of what He has in store for you to carry? Do you understand it starts with what's in your hand? What is in your hand? Moses, God said to Moses, what is in your hand? Moses, the, you know, what's in my heart is so big. And not, that's not what God said. God didn't say what's in your heart. God said what's in your hand. This is what I want to challenge you to know today. Some of you all need to hear this with great specificity. Because the dream that's in your heart doesn't resemble the seed that's in your hand. And if you have a love affair with the dream that exists in your heart, you will wind up sabotaging that which is in your hand, which is actually the key to what is in your heart. So back off from the love affair with what's in your heart and take a look at faithfulness of what's in your hand and let it unlock everything God wants to unlock in your life and in your future. If you've ever known somebody who's self-absorbed, then you know somebody whose attitude is toxic and they have a very unhealthy overall disposition, relationships are hijacked. There's an incapacity and inability to cultivate relationships correctly because they can never talk about anything except for themselves. They're never concerned about anything that worries or concerns you. It's always about what worries or concerns them. They're self-absorbed. A self-absorbed person is a very unhealthy individual. God knows how destructive it is to be self-absorbed. God knows how destructive it is to be self-absorbed. That's why he has always, from the very beginning when he began to establish his work in the earth, has always made giving connected to our increase a part of worship. You need to understand that. God has always made giving connected to the level of increase that we have connected to our worship. That's an expression of our worship. When the Israelites came out of Egypt, isn't it interesting? They carried the, Egypt, they carried the gold of Egypt out of Egypt. They didn't carry the gold of Egypt out of Egypt to establish an Israelite Egypt. They carried the gold out of Egypt to build the tabernacle and all the furniture pieces and to express the kingdom of God had come into the earth. And when the resources of the world come into the hands of God's people, the world begins to change. God shows up in powerful and profound ways. Societal transformation takes place. Community transformation waits and is awaiting for God's people to step into their place so that we all will fulfill everything God has called us to. And, and it is important that you understand your kids, how many of you agree? Your kids will have better marriages, better work, better career, better future, better life if they learn the principle of generosity. Can I just take a quick vote? If they will, I want my kids to learn what it is to be generous. We have a lot of conversations, particularly when they were younger, about what it was not just to share, but to share generously. Not just to give, but to give sacrificially. And that whole perspective of that as a lifestyle expression. I just want you to hear me say this today. Your kids will not learn generosity from their buddies. They will learn that from you and what you will do if you will teach them this principle and involve them in your worship in the way you give financially at church, in the way you bless other people's lives. When they begin to see that, sense that, know that, feel that, touch that, you're awakening something of the vicious cycle of blessing in their life and in your legacy. I want my kids to know. We, we took a, a paycheck years ago, and we cashed it in $1 bills so that it would make a pile of money. We took it home, and we put it on the table, and we told the girls, wow, look at, look at how God has blessed us. Do you know where this money came from? Where? 
It came from the application of gifts God has placed in our lives. And we use those gifts in what we call our vocation, our career, our call, whatever that looks like in each person's life. We use the gifts that God gave us to make the money that He empowered us to make. So, in essence, all of this money belongs to God because it all came from Him. The gifts that we have to make the money actually produce the cash, and this all belongs to God. We should give God some money to say thank you. How much should we give? And they said, well, it's God's. Let's give it all. And I said, hold on. Let's talk about this. And I said, God wants us to be able to buy food, and He wants us to be able to buy clothes. Don't you think that's good? Yeah, that's good. And so then we divided it into two even piles. And I said, wouldn't it make sense that if God gave it all and we could split it 50-50, we would really be blessed? And they said, yes, that's great. And I divided it into a big pile of 90 and a little pile of 10. And I said, wouldn't it make sense if God gave all of this to us that we would give Him 90 and we would keep 10. And they said, well, yeah. And I said, do you know how generous God is? He gives it all to us and lets us keep all of this. And we take this little 10% pile, and it's the expression, every time we increase, as a reminder, everything we have belongs to Him. God owns it, and God loans it, and we do with it what He is entrusting us to do. My kids got it. Listen, I'm just going to tell you, your kids will not learn that from their buddies. They're not going to learn that from your buddies. You're going to have to lead your kids in this example to help them understand. I want you to think about it with me. Proverbs 11:24 says, The world of the generous gets larger and larger, but the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. The world of the generous gets larger and larger, but the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. I was astonished to learn that if North America gave 10% of North America's income in one year, we would have $150 billion. That was astonishing to me. But what was more astonishing when I started evaluating what might be able to be done if we suddenly had that level of income transferred into the hands of God's people all across North America. $150 billion. Uh, The United Nations produced reports showing that the number one killer of all humanity, anybody know what it is? Number one killer of all humanity, contaminated water. When you walk out and you see a little water fountain there, give thanks to God. When you enjoy freely running water in your home, give thanks to God. I know you don't realize it unless you've lived extensively in third world countries, but you and I are blessed beyond our wildest imagination. The number one killer in the world is contaminated water. Isn't that wild? The United Nations published a report that said we could solve the problem with contaminated water in the entire planet with $10 billion. Now, I want you to put the two bits of pieces of information that I've shared with you together. If North America tithed, we would have $150 billion, more than, well, 15 times the amount needed to solve the number one killer of humanity suffering all over the planet, contaminated water. 15 times the amount we would need. $30 billion, according to the United Nations, solves the problem of world hunger. For $40 billion, we would solve contaminated water, number one killer in the world, and world hunger all over the planet. What could we do to absolutely transform the entire globe with the remaining $110 billion? If we can solve world hunger and contaminated water with 40, that would leave us $110 billion. Do you think we're going to have to stand before God and give an account for having grown up in the wealthiest nation of the world and how we handled having so much? Let me just give you the answer to that. (laughs) Big time. What kind of world awaits the obedient church? Imagine what kind of world exists on the other side of the obedient church. 25,000 miles to get around the planet. 25,000 miles 
of humanity suffering in unimaginable ways that we know very little about, 25,000 miles around this planet. What kind of world, what kind of human suffering could we eliminate on the other side of the obedient church? 25,000 miles. I want you to think 25,000 miles, and now I want you to bring that smaller to a five-foot circle. What kind of world, imagine what kind of world exists on the other side of your obedience. I can't control all of North America, but honey, I can control me. I can't control everybody, but as for me and my house, we're going to honor God, we're going to serve the Lord, and we're going to do whatever it takes to live our lives in a way that produces a sacrificial expression, lifting up the name of Jesus, and stop making excuses about it. Come on, celebrate and declare it today. You and I should all have two testimonies. We should all have two testimonies. We should, share, we should have a testimony of the life we gained by meeting Jesus and the life we gave by helping others to do the same. Those are the two testimonies we should have. This is not just my idea. It's not just love God, love others, though we see it wrapped up in that revelation as well. But we, this is biblical. This is what the Scripture says. How many of you know that every person that has ever been born in this earth will face God with a decision that they either made or didn't make to receive Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior? I want you to know the most important decision you can make above all every other decision you could ever think of is coming to the knowledge that Jesus Christ is who He says He is. He's the Messiah who came to rescue all humanity from fallen sin. You need to secure that in your life because the Bible says in John chapter 5, every one of us will stand before God in this judgment moment where salvation is at hand, and you will not be able to claim works for the judgment of salvation. You will only be able to claim Jesus and the work that He did. I mean, you know, works won't get you there. But 2 Corinthians chapter 5 talks about a second judgment. This is not just a good idea. This is a biblical layout. After this world, you and I are going to face these conversations with God. One, salvation, where you, have, you need to be able to say the blood of Jesus is enough. But then the, the, next, uh, the next judgment comes where we stand before God and we're judged for our works. And in the same way you can't stand in the judgment of salvation and claim works, you cannot stand in the judgment of works and claim grace. How you been living your life? This is very challenging to me. For me. I'm ready. I'm ready to go all in. Like more than I've ever been before. Something has unlocked in your pastor. I want you to know, I am ready to see the world transformed as a result of our surrendered available lives. Whatever it takes, I want us to get there. Let it be the case in this church. Let it be the case where we abandon all self-absorbed perspectives and see what God will begin to replenish and restore in our lives amazingly. You know, Tracy and I, uh, when I first got saved, I was a piece of work. Still am, but he loves me. Had my two-tone mullet. Sporting that mullet at church every week. And there I was at Hillcrest Baptist Church where I met Jesus Christ. Jim Burkett, Dr. James Burkett, preaching the sermon that morning. Dan Mooney, leading worship. Those of you who've been here for a number of years know Dan Mooney later became our worship pastor. Isn't that wild? Like the morning I accepted Christ, the guy leading worship would later be serving with that two-tone mullet punk kid as the pastor leading worship. It was really amazing uh, transition of, of time and how all that unfolded. But there I was, and, and man, those guys, they surrounded me. <clears throat> they, uh, they indoctrinated me. They challenged me. They didn't let me think and talk things that I had thought and talked for a while. How many of you know we need transformation? It doesn't just happen alone with you and God. It happens in community, the body of Christ. It, it's not people, it, it, true friends stab you in the front. You just need to understand that. <laughs> And these guys were good at it, man. They would look at me and tell me, that was stupid what you just said. Ugh, I love you too much. Now bleed a little bit, get over it, and let's move forward. <laughs> How many of you know we need that? And these guys didn't let me off the hook, man. They said, listen, you're saved now. You're a Christian now. You're on fire for God now. We're going to meet at 6 o'clock in the morning and pray. And I was like, well, okay, I guess that's what Christians do. That's why I lead 6 o'clock morning prayer, because they told me that's what you do. 
So I did it. Like I got up. I didn't want to get up, but I got up because they told me I needed to get up. I read the books they told me to read. I did the handouts they told me to do. I was like, man, this is, this is a lot of work to be a Christian. I didn't know it was so much work to be a Christian. It really isn't that work to be a Christian. It's just that I was so messed up. I needed a whole lot of this structure. And these guys just, they knew they kept on pouring in, pouring in, pouring in, pouring in. And I was a part of this church and, and constantly, you know, being poured into it until finally I started realizing, you know what? I've got something to offer. There started to be something happening within me as I got dignified by people around me. And I started to see something in myself I'd never seen before. I started coming to church early just to greet people in and tell them this is going to be a great day. This is your day. God's going to meet with you today. I wasn't a part of a greeting team. I just started to be awakened to the purposes of God. I suddenly started teaching a class and all the, the college students came. Tracy actually came to the church church and she saw me and she knew that I was on fire for God because it was a, it was a Baptist church, but it's kind of a Baptist church. And so some of us were, woo, woo, woo. And others were like, mm, what's going on? And so I was that, I was that crazy person. And so she noticed. And so she said, I'm going to go to his class. And so she went to my class, but she couldn't get in the class because I was on fire. I was on fire. And these college kids were coming and the place was so packed out. We could not get enough people into the room. Before I left that church, I was leading a college group with 120 people and I was their college pastor. And I don't know how God did that in such a short amount of time, but I'm just saying to you, wake up and get on fire and fulfill everything God's called you to in your life. First Corinthians chapter four, the verse I mentioned last week says, God will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's heart. At that time, each person will receive his praise from God. We praise God. God will praise you in the judgment of works after the cast party of the world takes place. He's going to look at you and say, thank you for your contribution to society. Thank you for your contribution to the expression of the kingdom. He's going to give you personal accolades. How many of you know that I was a part of establishing a movement in a church? That church is still strong today. That church is still continuing in ministry expression today. We moved from Stillwater to Norman. That in and of itself is crazy. <laughs> Lived on Nebraska Street. <laughs> and so we moved. And after three years of being there, being given to what God had called us to do, Tracy and I, that's where we met and of course got married, we were contributors to strengthen that church. We didn't have much, but we gave. And we gave sacrificially, financially, with our time, with our money, with our gifts, with our resources. You didn't have to recruit us and require us. We were there. We wanted to be there. We were in love with Jesus. I want to be more in love with Jesus. I don't want to have to be people compelling. Listen, to have to be motivated to do what's right is the lowest form of maturity. Let's grow up! And still today, the perpetuating motion of ministry that goes on in that church is credited to my account. This is why church is a part of the plan. You can say what you want about church. I get ticked off at the church. I'm sure you do too. That's what family does. Anybody have a frustrating time with your family this past week? Do not give up on your family. Embrace your family. Fulfill the call of God with your family. Same thing with the family of God. Let's walk this thing out. Whatever it takes, let's walk this thing out. And as we stay true to the course that God's called us to, what happens is we strengthen a ministry that will last long, long, much longer than any of us will, and it will perpetuate. Do you get what I'm saying? It will perpetuate for generations beyond, and in that moment when God is issuing his praise, he's assigning the fruit of the house that you are in to your life, beyond your life. Our church is making a difference. Every time you serve, every time you give, every time you make a sacrifice, the fruit of this house is applied to your life. I don't know if you realize it or not, but this year of flourishing, one of the things we did to establish a rhythm of celebrating the flourishing that God's bringing is every month on the first Sunday of the month, we do a 30-day in review of what we have seen God do in the previous month. And I want you to see that as we celebrate and think about the fruit that's being assigned to our lives.
Come on, let's just thank the Lord. He's so good. When God is giving praise, I mean, it's a crazy verse, isn't it? God is going to praise people. When God is giving praise and appreciation for the fruit of this house. I, I mean, you know, I mentioned Mary. We were standing in the lobby, and, and we just prayed again this week, just agreeing for continued good reports that she's had crazy, ridiculous health breakthrough after health breakthrough. And, and she said just tears and she said, this church has changed my life. And I really paid attention when she said it. And I thought, who's she talking about? She's talking about you. When Jesus is giving praise and appreciation for the footprint of compassion that was left in the earth, you are that person that he will be thanking because we are the church you can't go to church you are the church and we have wisdom to be the church that he's called us to be <clears throat> together we make up this family together we gather to worship contribute to the greater mission of God's purpose in the earth it is a really important part of our faith and to do so activates us spiritually activates us financially activates us in every way because it is part of God's plan the Bible says it and said it last week I want to reiterate it again Deuteronomy 14 23 I am talking about generosity and I am specifically talking to you about the sacrificial lifestyle you and I should learn to live as we follow the example of Christ and part of that plan has always been a worship of our tithes, a portion of increase that God brings into our lives. Deuteronomy 14, 23. The purpose of tithing is to teach you to always put God first in your lives. It's the purpose that will constantly come back every time we increase to put Him at the center of everything that's going on. And we as a church family want you to know, we as church leaders in this church family want you to know it is absolutely our conviction that we train, teach, equip, empower, impart the understanding that for you to discover God's best for your life is to learn to live a sacrificial life in the context of the family of God. <clears throat> so that's why we reference the Connect card. And I invite you, if you want to be a part of this church family, not just casual attending, but actually finding out what it is to really be devoted to what God's trying to awaken in the earth as a result of our gathering, then I invite you to fill out that Connect card. We'll have a personal meeting with you, and we'll start to walk you through what that's going to look like. We do this focus every year in the first 40 days of the year, so as we get close to 2019, I'll bring more and more emphasis to that. And I want you to know we're going to send you out these little uh, letters this quarter. Every quarter we send you a report to update you on your giving and to celebrate some of what's going on in the church. And this week you will find in your enclosed letter a pledge card. I want you to hear it from me before you get it in the mail so that you understand. We're not asking you to do anything. But we want to be responsible with our projections about what God is stirring in our hearts for this coming year. And we're already starting to talk about some things for 2020 that we want to bring emphasis but we've got to prepare for them more in advance with the magnitude of what we're sensing God is actually taking us into a few years down the road. So all we're asking you to do is to be prepared the first Sunday in November. We are going to have what we'll call a pledge Sunday. All that means is we'll ask everybody to simply write down what you believe God's stirring in your heart, your giving will look like next year. We're not asking you to give anything other than what you believe God's asking you to give, but we want you to report that so that we can make some accurate projections and be as financially responsible as we possibly can with everything God is entrusting to our care as a, uh, as a group of leaders trying to really fulfill this in the best way we know how. Your action point. I want to ask you to purpose a discussion over a meal this week with family or friends and discuss how you translate a blessed life into an expression of a blessing. How do you do that? Because you need to learn to do that. 
We, um, when the girls were little, we, we would commission them every day. Make a daily difference. Make a daily difference. It just They heard us say it every day. Make a daily difference. And then at dinner, when we would have a meal on any given night, that was our table conversation. What's God been speaking to you as you've been listening to what he has to say? And how did you make a difference in somebody's life today? And the girls at a young age, though, somebody needed a pencil. And I, I saw that they needed a pencil, Dad. And so I, I got one out of my bag and I gave it to him. And I was like, that is awesome. That's Jesus. You understand? Every age level of this is so important that we're training and equipping and being trained and equipped in and of ourselves. So purpose this expression in conversation this week. And I believe God wants to take us deeper and awaken the purposes of God within our hearts. Let's stand together. You know, I am uh, I'm guilty as charged. I, our, our team gets on to me sometimes because I'm just an includer. I mean, there's, there's never, hardly ever something we do that I just don't want everybody to come be a part. And I am... We, we started this, we've never done this before, but we've just kind of looked at what we see as the five most transformational things that God has entrusted to our care as a church over the years that I've been uh, the lead pastor. And we're focusing with newer families that maybe haven't experienced these things uh, between the two services at 11 o'clock. It's about a 20-minute segment just above the coffee bar, basically. You can go up the elevator or the stairs in that middle room, the media room. And we're bringing a focus up there each week, five weeks, of the five most transformational things that God's ever entrusted to our care as a church. And so I, I would invite you, if you'd like to pop in on that, this is week two of five. And I think we had about 25 people up there last week, something like that. But there's room. I, I, here's the thing. I just want I want to grow further, deeper. I want to help anybody and everybody we possibly can to become everything God's called you to be. It's, it's the cry of my heart that I sense is the cry of God's heart. As I'm talking to you, I just feel the compassion and the, the drive and the desire of God behind like this big wall of pressure and my words of this little trickle. Just That's why I get so... <laughs> They take pictures of me when I'm preaching. I'm just like, ah, don't use that. I mean, I look like I'm constipated or something. It's just awful. <laughs> it's just so, so much pressure. You know, you just feel the love and power. God just wants to do something profound in your life. Yeah. Amen. It all starts in a moment of surrender when you address the cross and embrace the Savior. Yeah. And you say, Lord Jesus, you came to rescue all humanity from our sin. <laughs> Would you just join me in that? Maybe you've never prayed that prayer before. Maybe you're just standing here and you say, I'm just clothed in a place of sin right now, and I need to be clothed in Christ. I want to break free from this. But come on, either that, whatever that is, would you just posture yourself just to receive as we pray today? And let's pray it out loud. Everyone say it with me. Lord Jesus, you are the giver of life, the Savior of the world. You came, you lived, you died. You were the seed placed in the ground, but you're alive. And now we are called to be sons and daughters. We accept your sacrifice for our sins. Be Lord of our lives. Teach us your ways, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.